Oh. <laughs> All right, so we are on the hour here, so we'll get started. On behalf of Contact North, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar, How to Enhance, Extend, and Even Transform Your Teaching with Hyper-Engaging Strategies. My name is Sarah Gover. I'm a research associate at Contact North, and I'll be moderating this session today. I'd like to start off with a provincial land acknowledgement. Contact North respectfully acknowledges that our work and the work of our community partners takes place on traditional Indigenous territories across the province. We are grateful to be able to work and live in these territories. We are thankful to the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time in memoriam and who continue to strengthen Ontario and all communities across the province. Okay, so before we get started, a few housekeeping items. The chat is open. Just remember to select everyone on the pull down menu. But if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A tool and you will find that tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, Curtis and Mena will address these at the end of the session. You can also use the upvote on the questions. That's the little thumb icon that you have at the bottom of each question posted. Uh, if you click on that, it just means the question resonates with you and um, it will be brought to the top of the queue and answered uh, quicker. I would also like to point out that we have live captioning. You can activate it through the closed caption tool at the bottom of your screen. Once the webinar has finished, I'll post the link to the recording as well as the presentation slides uh, to teachonline.ca and I'll put that link in the chat momentarily and you will also get it emailed to you in about 24 hours. Okay, on to the main event. I would like to introduce our speakers today, the authors of the newly released book, Transformative Teaching Around the World, Stories of Cultural Impact, Technology Integration and Innovative pedagogy. Good read. I took it with me on my trip to Mexico and read it on the beaches. Um, so we have Dr. Curtis Bonk, Professor of Instructional Systems Technology in the School of Education and Adjunct Professor in the School of Informatics at Indiana University, and Dr. Mena Zhu, Assistant Professor of Learning Design and Technology in the College of Education at Wayne State University. Welcome, Curtis and Maynan. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. And um, I will say, I'll hold up the bottom part of the book so you can see the red. It's IU Colors. We have Indiana University colors, red, black, and white. Um, so if you're an Indiana University alum, um, we did try and abide by that in the Transformative Teaching Around the World book. Uh, so happy to see many of you here from Kenya, from Kazakhstan, from Ottawa, from a lot of people from Canada, from Slovenia, from UK, US, Japan, Argentina, Australia. Thank you, Sam Nadu, the editor of Distance at, at, uh, Learning. And we have people from Jordan, from Kenya, from Mexico, from Saudi Arabia, from Nepal from Singapore, from South Africa, if I haven't said it already, China, Italy, uh, Denmark, and on and on. Uh, we had 177 people sign up and most of them at the last minute. So there's some me momentum going on in here. Uh, and so we're glad to have that momentum. Today, in this talk, we're gonna try and provide a new framework, actually, something that it, I, we only tried once before, and that was last week at Beijing Normal when we did a similar talk, um, a longer one. This one will be better than that. So this is a brand new framework based on a course I've been doing for 30 years. And the results of it ended up in the book, Transformative Teaching Around the World with Rutledge. Um, and it's, that book is based on a book called Learning Journeys by Marshall Goldsmith. And I couldn't put that book down. It'd be just like Sarah was talking about with this one. And I said, I wanna do a book like that. And that was 20 years ago. It took me 20 years to come to that, to find the right people, the great people that we have writing chapters from 22 countries around the world on how they're using the ideas on critical thinking, creative thinking, cooperative learning and motivation to change education. So we'll talk about ideas for creativity, critical thinking, convergent, divergent reasoning, teamwork, as well as the motivational energy they're in. Three-part talk, the first part is the framing of this, but I'm gonna go through that a little fast to get to part two. 
which is the strategies and methods that you can use. Part three will be some of the people in the book um, and we'll only cover that for the last five minutes or so. Part two will be the main thing here. So bear with me as we're in, in part one. Initially, Mayna, you, you have anything to add before we start here? No, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen if I can find it again and just say, this is hyper-engaging strategies to enhance, extend, and transform your teaching. Uh, and hopefully you can transform your teaching. And open activity in the chat window. What's your favorite online learning activity? What's a, what do you like to, as a learner, learn online, or as a teacher, utilize online? What's, what, give it a name, give it a label, give it something, um, whatever it is. You can steal other people's ideas from the chat window. They don't have to be original. They, they can be half-baked, half-thought up. Whatever you want to say, it's okay. Thank you, Sunny, for coming from San Francisco area. It's great to see you here. Thank you for some of my friends. Jenny is here. Great to have you here. Um, Mena, what do we hear so far in the chat? I don't have the chat open. What do you see, Mena? Um, breakout room. H5B. In the in the chat window. Yeah. So the favorite online activities right now they said uh, breakout room and then Mentimeter, uh, read and act. Okay. H5P games. Yeah, Ask I see it now. Picture sharing. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. What is your favorite type of learning technology today? What is a, your favorite learning technology today? I'm uh, curious what people are using. Uh, they have Scavenger, Kahoot, Teams, H5P, Zoom, Adpuzzle, Top Hat, AR, World War, uh, Brightspace, D2L, Teams, Screencasting Tools, Pagamo, Portfolio, Great, yeah. great. I'm not gonna talk about, and Maine and I are not gonna talk about any of those. <laughs> no, we will probably talk about some of those along the way. Um, so we've already asked the first polling question. We're gonna move on to the second polling question. Are we in the midst of A, a learning evolution in education? B, a learning revolution in education? C, neither. won't tell you what the people in Beijing normal said. Well, they are across all of China took that, our session. We had 2,000 people, almost. It's pretty tight race right now. Better get your votes in. <laughs> you got um, 61 out of 86 responded. Let's try and get a couple more because it is, it is exactly tied. It is tied. It is a tie. Get your vote in now. <laughs> okay, why don't we reveal the results, Sarah? So far, we have 69 people, all 69 voted, and it's it's a evolution. Unfortunately, the folks in our seminar, but well, we have a lot of convincing to do may not, in the next hour. It, it is a revolution. No, it could be either. It, it may be both um, for some people, and depends on the part of the world where you're in. So we'll stop the sharing on that, uh, Sarah, and I'll move on to the next slide. You know, if you're reading the Chronicle of Higher Education or the Guardian or Inside Higher Ed or some or the conversation in Australia or the evolution in Canada with three L's in evolution, you're reading about teaching and learning in the during the pandemic and all sorts of people pulling their hair out <laughs> or um, experimenting with all sorts of things that they can do in their classes. And you may be experimenting too. So let's go to poll three, Sarah. Uh, have you reflected on your teaching philosophy or your learning approach? If you're a learner and not a teacher, have you reflected on learning approach during this pandemic? And, you know, many times I've dramatically changed my philosophy. You know, um, many times I'm taking action. I'm coming to webinars like Mena Jews and Dr. Vong's webinar. Uh, yes, I thought about it a couple of times. I'm tweaking it. No, I'm brain dead right now, like my friend Samnadu probably is. It's late at night in Aus in Melbourne. Uh, no, my teaching is basically the same. So what do we have there for answers? We got 50 people filling this out. And 
Now we're up to 55. Let's get the 60, Sarah, before we reveal the results. We're now at 60. Hang on one second. And we've got 75%. Sarah, why don't we reveal the results on that? And the majority, many times, it's number two answer, many times, and they're taking action, meeting people. So they're, that 81% of you are doing something. Uh, some of you are thinking about it. Very few of you are not thinking about it. You know, less than one in 10. So Sarah, will take that one away. We'll stop the sharing on there and we'll move on. So part one, as I said, I'll go through part one rather quickly so I can get to part two, but I want to situate these, this talk before we do that and situate it in, in a new learning environments because the students are coming to us who are expecting us to experiment with our teaching practices, to be more inclusive, to involve them more to give them more ownership, to be more self-directed, to have more choice, and to be more inclusive in your classrooms and respectful of their cultures. And so we have to create learning environments that are effective. And humans have thought about learning environments for millennia and how to design those learning environments. And here at Indiana, we're in the midst of massive changes in terms of teaching and learning in our um, classroom settings. In fact, the night before last, I was teaching in our alcove for active learning um, technology on, on, on IU's campus. And Mena, when she was a student here, was her last job as a GA helping with what was called the Mosaic Project. So Mena, you want to talk about the Mosaic Project and some of these pictures? Yeah, in general, I will have an initiative on a mosaic uh, product. Uh, I shared a link in the chat window. Uh, you can explore it. Uh, in this project, they, we provided like a faculty uh, professional development on how to use active learning classrooms. Um, there are two different types. One is for formal classroom teaching, one is for informal students' learning space. For classroom teaching, uh, this uh, initiative provided the PD for the faculty members and give them a research opportunities and a funding incentives. Um, I think Dr. Bonk is teaching in one of the classroom uh, this semester, right? Um, for informal learning space, like in IUPUI, we have the idea garden uh, where uh, the purpose of that space is to uh, develop students' creative thinking uh, skills and design and development skills. Uh, students from STEM ad, uh, field or art creative design field can use this uh, space and uh, collaborate together. Um, so the, the person at the bottom of the screen on the right is Stacy Maroney, who was the director of a VP of IT on this campus and learning technologies. She is now the dean of the School of Ed, and she has the last chapter in this book because she we have the former dean writing the forward and she wrote the afterward. So um, I want to thank Stacy uh, for doing that. And so you may recognize her who have been here and you see the faculty are very much involved in interactive uh, discussions. And Maine has written a couple of pieces, maybe an EDUCAUSE review, uh, one is published, maybe not. Is, um, uh, Maina, do you want to mention where some of the articles from this are published? Uh, uh, we, we did have, uh two research pa paper publications on active learning classroom. Uh, one of the classroom was uh, was the one in school of education. Uh, that classroom was used for the pre-service teacher uh, training on uh, education program. And then we use the classroom to uh, actively engage students in collaborative learning and hands-on activities. Um, and yeah, so people uh, might might look for as Anastasia Maroney on one paper with Mena and one with Merve Bazdegan in Educause Review. I think they have two papers and one on the Idea Garden as well. And with some of our class, this is an old swimming pool that's been remodeled to be a, a speed dating with technology. <laughs> speed dating in a different way, but speed dating to learn about new technologies and to integrate them on your campuses. And we have a speed dating event coming up in a couple of weeks, in fact. Uh, and so, and we have theater, uh, types of classrooms at our IUPUI campus and you know we're experimenting all the time but it's not just Indiana in fact uh, Australia where Sam is from over if you went over to Adelaide they have a learning hub and the learning hub uh, had students on the on the committee to figure out how they want to redesign the building to be more social and be more collaborative to to have different um, floors of the building represent different types of, of interactions and learning 
you know, this is all well and good, but during the pandemic, people weren't doing these kinds of things. They weren't in these kinds of settings anymore. They were virtual virtual settings. In fact, at Arizona State, they now have an, an initiative at Arizona State called the um, uh, uh, 100 Million Learners Initiative back from January of 2022. Uh, and they wanna get free courses in business, in, in um, entrepreneurship and data an analytics and global financial accounting. So we have to create new, new learning environments, both physical and virtual. And this will have um, AI grade students papers and so forth. Um, and at Stanford, they have a new kind of class where there is 10,000 students taught by 90 or 900 volunteer teachers. 10,000 students from 120 countries. So again, new, new structures, new learning environments, just like MOOCs and some of my research during the past decade and Maina's research with me have looked at MOOCs and how people self-direct um, through taking MOOCs. And we now have an article in review on 15 uh, principles or aspects of self-directed learning in such environments, because we're moving to an age of being more innovative. We're moving beyond education 1.0 and 2.0 to 3.0. And my friends in Thailand want to follow that 4.0 and letting students innovate and design and produce knowledge, um, innovation producing environments that we need to create to have truly a transformative learning experience for our students. And so some places are constantly thinking and, and moving ahead uh, because people are living longer. And as people live longer, they're gonna need a retooling and reskilling and upskilling. And there's gonna be what's called the 60 year curriculum. And as we move to a 60 year curriculum, we have to think about you know, what are the ways to support the students throughout their lifespans? What are the kinds of structures that we have to put in place, hybrid, blended, fully online, face-to-face, -face, and a combination thereof, because learning is changing. My friends at Dubai Men's College on the left there, or it's more social in nature. When I went to there 15, 20 years ago, it was not that way. And my teacher training at Indiana on the right there, you can see people are, are showing each other what they're do, learning. They're, it's a Starbucks cafe kind of model today, uh, the learning environments that we're creating. So I'm calling this education 2020, like 2020 vision, because we have 20 new roles of instructors in an online environment, all start with the letter C, whether one is a, a concierge or a cook or a coach or a collaborator or a, a consumer advocate or a consultant, we have all these roles, you know, we have the curator role, we're finding the best elements and making them available in our class. Open educational resources, free textbooks, um, animations, simulations, videos, you name it, they're available in our classes. And we have to be a, a, a orchestra conductor putting them all together. We have to be a concierge in a hotel at times, a counselor, a consultant. We have to be available for our students in different ways in different times so as to help cultivate the, uh, the, the finest harvest possible. So that's the 20 there in terms of 20 roles of the instructor. I've also got 20 principles. Now, David Merrill has the first principles instruction, so I can't have the first principles, but I could take the last principles. So in the last principles instruction, uh, um, which is, is uh, something I'm playing around with, I haven't written a book about this yet, we have 20 principles there too, flexibility and convenience, um, choice and options, having multiple uh, assignment task options to choose from. The first time I taught fully online, I had four assignments. My students hated me. The second time I taught online, I had 10. You pick any four to do, they love me. You have to have uh, opportunities to explore or students. This semester, I have a 112 page syllabus called the monster syllabus. Everything's free. I had my students design an alternative syllabus. If they, you don't like it, let's, it, it's a course on emerging technologies for learning. Well, let's, let's design an alternative syllabus, which they did. So they have two syllabi every week to go from. Give them some empowerment, give them some autonomy, and give them some choice. And my course basically doubled in its impact because they got involved in what should be those extra 15 topics that we're going to cover in the course that Dr. Bunk doesn't know anything about. You know, and what can we lead the way on? And so there's some great weeks on language learning, on STEM and drones and all, AI and all sorts of things. But we have to provide those syllabi, but also support and give feedback to students along the way. We have gentle nudges, peer feedback, system feedback, self-feedback, expert feedback, prior student feedback, as well as instructor feedback. 
You can't just rely on instructor feedback in today's environments or you will die. So you create critical friends to interact or web buddies or email pals or bring prior students back into the class to explain what they did in the class. And some of you have been my former students before. If you were a student in one of my classes before, could you just say yes? So I can see what names come up in the screen and maybe Mayna will read a few up. So you also have to be, you have to be organized, but you have to be spontaneous. You have to be, you know, you have to need both. You can't be too organized and so as to bore your students to tears, you have to try something different. This talk is different. We've not tried this particular talk before. So some of it may not work as, as we design, but we, we, we are willing to accept some failures along the way. The, the reason Pixar are so popular and everything's a success because they're willing to accept failure along the way and, and be willing to generate ideas and so forth and then share those ideas. We've moved from silos when I started in higher ed 30 some years ago to the principle of sharing what we're doing. Sharing in Merlot, our learning objects, sharing our syllabi, sharing our class activities, um, it being also hopefully being inspiring in the process because some of the students come with emotional baggage during the pandemic they, they, to, to showcase the, the passion that you have for the discipline or about the particular topic for the week and bringing it into an authentic, as my friend Ron Oliver at Edith Cowan University and Tom Reeves at Georgia and Jan Harrington, also in Western Australia, they talk about relevance and meaningful and authentic learning environments. And their book on authentic online learning is a great book, buy their book. If you want to create authentic online experiences, just look up Tom Reeves or Ron Oliver or Jen Harrington. But we also have to think about the expandedness of our environments. We have so much stuff. In 2009, I came out with a book called The World is Open. And this book describes these new open possibilities for learning, whether it's podcasts or whether they're learning through TED Talks or we're learning through wikis. My students are writing wiki books, cross-cultural wiki books with other students around the world this expandedness of our resources and how do we pull in the reins a bit as well as release the reins and back and forth between exploration and reflection. You don't want to just do exploration, but you want to have opportunities to reflect, 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 debrief, debrief, debrief. These are the 20 principles behind the Education 2020 model that I'm working on. I've not done the book yet, but this is the learning environment that I'm working towards in the roles of the instructor, the counselor, curator, consultant, as well as the principles of learning in that environment um, of expanded resources, of empowerment, of high expectations, of collegiality, all these things. If you know a few of these things, I think you'll find more successes in your classes, or at least I hope so, because learning is changing. Learning has become more open, more online, more blended, more hands-on, more game-like, more massive, uh, more collaborative, it's changing in front of our eyes. We're moving from an age of Wikipedia to Videopedia because the storage of, of video is just astronomical. So a second talk that I've designed recently is how to use shared online video to apprentice students in your classes. And maybe I might be back for a second session, maybe later on this summer to talk, uh, I'll talk to Sarah about that one but I'm really been utilizing video in my class, bringing guests from around the world every week. In fact, Sam, who's here, Sam Nadu, he's come a couple of times into my class and participated in my different classes. All, you know, just having people pop in, you know, any, at any time to, to inspire, to discuss, to explain the research, to elaborate on where their research is going and, and what's not in the research article, what was cut from the research article, what was deleted by the editors, you know, along the way. So, Learning is more informal, more video-based. So in New Zealand, five years ago, I gave a talk about 30 ways learning is changing. And maybe Mena can find the link to that article, 30 ways learning is changing in my name. But put it, it's a free open access article from uh, the New Zealand Journal on Flexible Online Learning. So poll number four, does your work setting or school environments embrace this new Education 3.0 or Education 2020? So if um, Sarah could put that uh, poll number four on display here. Um, yes, no, or not sure. Does your work setting or school embrace that? Yes, no, or not sure. This is interesting too. Okay. I'd be curious to see what Mayna thinks about her environment. <laughs> I should probably answer this question myself, but I think it doesn't allow me to. Uh, 
All right, we've got 73, 74 people have answered this question out of 105, that's not too bad. Let's uh, let a couple more answer this question. We're up to 75, 76, do we get to 80? Do we get to 80? Please, come on, come on, four more, four more, fill it out. <laughs> All right, since people are, oh, 77, we got 77, do we have first? Okay, what we reveal the results on this, and the overwhelming majority of you said, <laughs> why don't we uh, reveal, thank you, Sarah. Uh, it is 45% are not sure. <laughs> People are not sure if we're doing this. Well, that means this, this talk is important because we don't know what the heck Education 3.0 is. And when I go off to Thailand, we don't know what 4.0 is. Heck, we don't even know what 2.0 is. So 34%, one in three say, yeah, we're doing it. 21% about one in five are saying, nope, we're not doing it. And the rest of you, majority, we're not sure. Uh, we can stop sharing. Sarah, thank you very much on that. We have a few more polls coming up. Uh, later on in in the show. Uh, so part two, as I said, I wanted to get to part two a little fast and just set the stage of part one. I hope it wasn't too much of a bumpy ride for all of you. I hope you enjoyed the view and the visions and the, the ideas that we shared about new learning environments and about new educational opportunities. But we only briefly talked about that. I mean, there's so much more, so many more opportunities if we wanted to go through all the open access possibilities for learning, all the self-directedness opportunities for learning. Just yesterday, last night, I was watching Albert Bandura's uh, life history, the discussion of his work in social cognitive learning theory. And he says, the number one thing about his little school in north of Edmonton, where he grew up in Canada, is that everyone was a K-12 in school. Everyone is there, you know, teachers taught everything, but he got to self-direct his learning environment. He got to learn about self-directedness and, and, and his passion about being a self-directed learner influenced his theory about self-efficacy and, and um, self-competence and so forth. So, you know, the most popular theories to, in psychology ever is really has, a, has its roots in what I'm talking about here. We have to create flexible learning environments. My former student, Brian Beatty, has a book free. You can download it right now on hybrid learning, flexible learning, what's called the high flex model. Now, many people have Brian's picture on their dartboard and they throw darts at him because this is hard to do high flex learning because you're doing both, you're letting students come face to face or online every week. And he, um, so I have a weekly podcast show called Silver Lining for Learning. He was on a few months back. You can look up silverliningforlearning.org and Brian Beatty and get his vision and the teachers who are using its vision. He brought two teachers with him talking about high flex model. So, I, I, he's at San Francisco State, by the way. So Sonny, who's in the audience today in San Francisco, you, you maybe know him, maybe meet with him. Um, so my free book, which I talked about the previous two shows that I've been with Contact North last year and the year before, I presented on the Tech Variety book. This is free. This is free in Chinese and in English. Um, we've had 250,000 people download it the first couple of years alone, so there might be close to a million now. Um, it has 10 chapters related to 10 motivational principles, from tone and climate to encouragement, curiosity, variety. You see them all there. We have 10 activities for each of the 10. What, what we're doing now, we just finished, is a revision or an update to this. There'll be a new course, an actual free class from the Commonwealth of Learning. Just type in col.org. We ha will have a free class come in June and a new ver updated version of this book, really short, that um, the Commonwealth of Learning hopes to train teachers around the world, or instructors around the world in, in motivating online learners. So that'll be a book about motivating in an online environment, something like that. But it's basically based on this book. There's another book for TESOL teachers that just came out based on this book called Engaging Online Language Learners, a Practical Guide from TESOL um, with my colleague, Dr. Frida Powen and Xiaojing Ko. So there's various spinoffs of this book and I presented on it twice. And so I'm not gonna do this today, um, but you can see the, the framework that we've designed there. That's, you don't have to do all these things, but if you did four or five of these in your classes, you will have Dr. Bong's guarantee you will have a successful class, hopefully. <laughs> I'll qualify what I say. Um, so, and, and you can write to me if you can't find it um, and want to get the links, but it's, it may not could put the link maybe in, the, in, in there for everybody if you haven't already. But I have a sister book to that um, that 
gets at another 100 activities called Read, Reflect, Display, and Do, Empowering Online Learning. So um, that's the R2D2 model, Read, Reflect, Display, and Do. So between the two books, I have 200 activities. What I'm trying to point out is during the past couple of decades, I've created these two frameworks, Tech Variety and R2D2. R2D2 walks, you know, with Twitter, you're reading things. With online news, you're reading things. And with infographics, you're reflecting, hopefully, on the viability of the content, what, what does data mean, and so forth. Read, reflect, display, you're showcasing in visualizations and concept maps, mind maps, and do. My students design podcasts. My students do um, YouTube videos. My students do wikis and wiki books. Um, so read, reflect, display, and do, R2D2. You're dividing the web up into four things you can do. Tech variety, it's 10 things you can do. Well, today we're gonna to talk about a new model. You're the first ones. Um, I actually didn't mention this in our talk at Beijing Normal last week. We, what we, we want low risk, low cost, low time activities. So in the first two books there, we have a whole chart of which activities are low risk, low cost, low time. But today I'm gonna to divide things up into four quadrants for creative thinking, critical thinking, collaborative learning, and motivation. And so um, I'm curious in this next poll, if you can put this up, Sarah, what topic are you most interested in Mena and I discussing here this, this afternoon in the last half hour that we have? And by the way, we have 30 minutes at the end to keep the, the stream open for Q&A. So there'll be time at the end to ask questions and that's why we're not doing Q&A along the way. Um, but we'll have plenty of time at the end. We will stay um, until 11.30 Eastern time 11.30 p.m. in Beijing. Uh, so what do we have here? What topics most interested to you? Well, we've got 72 people, 76 people so far. Okay, well, this is tight. This is really tight. Okay, but not too surprising. Okay, and why don't we show the results there? We've got 182. So number one answer by slight, slight, slight margin is motivation. And if you download the Tech Variety book, by the way, on, motiv uh, on motivation and retention, the most popular chapters are, are the chapter on tone and climate and curiosity. You know, everyone wants to build curiosity. Collaboration and teamwork, yeah. And then we get to critical and creative thinking. So we will start with motivation, just what you've asked for. See, we knew, Maina and I knew what you're gonna ask for. So we will start with motivation and we'll end with collaboration. And then we'll, so we'll go motivation, then creativity, and then critical thinking. Life, and we can stop the sharing there uh, if you want. Uh, life is a, oh, if we haven't shared, if did you, did you share already? Um, I guess you did, right? So life is a generative evaluative process. And we've got this, you know, this four part new model. In fact, I just designed this little jigsaw yesterday. So we'll wanna think about motivation first. And, and how to create that learning environment, that energy. So motivation is the energization towards something or energization of human behavior away from something. Hopefully it's towards something. We wanna engage people in our learning activities, in our tasks. Um, creative thinking involves the generation or diversity of ideas. Critical thinking often involves the logical analysis thereof or convergent kinds of thinking or judgment, and collaboration involves learning how to interact with others in a team setting so as to be more effective, more efficient and productive, hopefully, and expand the capabilities of what you could do alone on, on your own. As Vygotsky said, we, we can learn on a social plane a lot more than we can on an individual one because we can see the strategies and the ideas and the explanations and elaborations of others and we can internalize those along the way when we interact with our partners our social partners we have knowledge move from an interpsychological plane to an intrapsychological one i had to put a little psychology in there because i used to be an educational psychologist before they kicked me out i used to be a cpa before they kicked me out of that and soon they'll kick me out of educational technology uh, so motivation how do we provide that 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 incentives to the energization towards doing something, the visions, the goals. Humans are goal-driven creatures. And as some of you know who follow my Facebook, I've jogged 753 days in a row 
I was trying to get only maybe 10 at, when I started. I've been running through the pandemic. I've had this goal. I've, you know, in, in the summertime, I have different, how many papers do I want, want to write this week? And what, so goals, we're all goal-driven creatures. So number 10 in the Tech Variety book is building goals, goal-driven, goal-driven um, yielding products. So Mena and I can hopefully um, get people motivated through our uh, attire at times, <laughs> but also through our activities that we embed in our classes. So often in my classes, in fact, on Monday night, this is my class activity this past Monday before my lecture, I had a warm-up activity. I said to them, what are the educational uses of mobile that you know about? And we opened a Jamboard up. And I got to hear what they're thinking about, what they're using, what they're doing in terms of mobile before I lectured on mobile, before I got brought in a guest expert on mobile, talking about his research and his dissertation two months ago on mobile learning. So I got the, them engaged in the topic, didn't just lecture to them, didn't just bring in a guest. I got their ideas and opinions and, and so forth. And, you know, I, I often will, will get my students talking about, you know, the... Um, um, incidental things. What are things that people don't know about you? I want to get them into icebreaking activities so they get to know each other um, better and can interact with each other. Maybe a recent uh, accomplishment, a recent peak performance, um, something that they're really good at. I open up these jam boards. I do all sorts of things. I get thought on tape uh, on table instead of writing on a on a napkin or on a on a Kleenex in a restaurant. We're writing on a virtual space here. So why not have a lot of things on, on these virtual napkins? When I taught this course face-to-face, -face, we had four marker boards around the room. We'd fill them up before class even started with different topics. And then we could go through the, the class with all these ideas on the board. Well, the same you can do in Jamboard or in Padlet or other things. You know, what epitomizes your life theme? You know, um, no regrets. Why not? Do it now. Love yourself. No Saturday classes anymore with Dr. Bonk. Uh, you can see what they what they put in here. Um, I just felt like running. Okay. Um, and I've been trying a new idea out. Um, a couple of years ago, one of my guests was the founder of Flipgrid. Uh, he's a friend of mine, if you've seen Flipgrid. And he said, why don't we do an Ask Me Anything session where students can just ask whatever. when they?" So I often will have you know times in my classes where we do an AMA. And you would, it's a real enlightening thing. You don't have to prepare anything for it because you don't know what they're going to ask. So it's nothing, no stress really involved in this. It gets people to be more honest and genuine and interactive and collaborative. And so he, we had breakout groups doing the Ask Me Anythings and they came back to the main group. So we had, these were face-to-face -face in Bloomington. These were the online students. So I had a blended or hybrid class doing this Ask Me Anything. Um, ask Me Anything about instructional strategies, you know? And then when we have guests, so we had um, the head of education at the Commonwealth of Learning a few weeks ago, Sanjaya Mishra, Sam Nadu came to that session, if he remembers, and Sam um, and I and others put questions in the Jamboard and we asked them questions. So we had all these warm up questions. We had all these waiting and if Sanjaya ran out of things to say, we had all these questions that, you know, ready for him or we could start with the questions and so forth. Now I mentioned Flipgrid. My students are doing introductions in Flipgrid. They're doing um, article discussions. It's threaded video. Instead of threaded text, you can use Flipgrid for flip threaded video. My former mentee, his name is Charlie Miller, was a University of Minnesota professor when he built Flipgrid. He now is a vice president at Microsoft because they bought it out and it's free from Microsoft. I also use Padlet to do student introductions. So we use Flipgrid to introduce last semester or last year. Now this year I'm using Padlet for my student introductions about their hobbies, their locations. And then you can, you can comment at the bottom of them and, and point out what you have in common with somebody and get them to interact with each other about the class and you get them to know something about each other in the class. The incognizant of time, got 20 minutes left. Um, uh, we also are using a Padlet to brainstorm ideas. Here we're brainstorming uh, about the topic of MOOCs. What are your opinions? What are your ideas? What are your perceptions? What are your biases about MOOCs? And this is, a, a Padlet's like a sticky wall. You put, post things just, just like Jamboard. It's a sticky wall, a, a sticky wiki. And, it, you know, it, it, but it's limited. 
the free version is limited in terms of your account, whereas Jamboard is unlimited and free. Now, you can't use Jamboard typically in China, mainland China, but there are ways around that. There are tools, other tools that you can use. Um, another way to motivate students is to say, you design your own, your own activities. So I, I had a student named Linda, and, and, and Linda um, said, you know, that content wasn't really connecting with her at first, but she wanted to do an activity where she, she took the Ted Variety book and created tutorials on it, um, introductions of each chapter. It took her 360 hours to design these 10 explanatory videos. I could never assign a 360 hour assignment to my students, but they can do it to themselves, <laughs> you know? So the, the power in letting them choose you know, and, and, and she's learning critical thinking skills, creative thinking skills, design skills, graphic design, uh, video editing, uh, communication skills, all sorts of digital learning skills of the 21st century in this activity. Uh, and these are available to any of you. You could use these in your class and are really nicely done, really a slick job explaining what, what feedback is and explaining about the curiosity chapter and the meaningfulness and all sorts of things in there and about the framework. Um, so another thing that I like to do for motivation is to include something that's happening in the news, some, something I can pull into the class and showcase with them, whether it's this new virtual uh, channel from violin players around the world, or it's, for me, there's uh, a, a runner's world is, is promoting people who are running through the pandemic. There's some people who have run, run thousands of days in a row uh, through the pandemic. This guy is a couple hundred days in front of me. I think he's near 1,000 now. And so I include this, you know, if you're teaching fitness, if you teach health, if you teach, um, you know, anything related to, you know, uh, anatomy, um, you know, these things, something in the news. If you teach paleontology, there's something in the news about dinosaurs every day. So include things in the news. Include open education resources in your class. You know, uh, if you teach a, a museum education, there's a website for, that has cataloged all the virtual museums in the world, from the Louvre to the MoMA to on, on down. And you can explore violins of different centuries or whatever you want uh, to do, or cellos and so forth uh, at the MIMO. Um, so, you know, they, this website, uh, and maybe Mena could, could put the link, it's, it, it, it's called MCM, and I'm not positive. MCM got to do with museums, and um, maybe you can find out for us what the two other letters stand for. I've forgotten now. Uh, museum. Okay, so it's Museum Computer Network. Thank you. It's right in front of my eyes. I cannot read. Um, so yeah. So include open educational resources. Include news. Those are ways to motivate people to ex have them explore them. You know, um, in my learning technologies class, I put all sorts of um, free and open contents available in my class. Have games, have activities where people are playing games and interacting, maybe Kahoot you're using, uh, maybe having the competitions. My students love these interactive competitions in Kahoot. Kahoot is free. I met the guy who built it. He's from Norway. He's a, he comes from the Florence of Norway, yeah. And he, um, <laughs> and he is a computer science professor. There's a web, website I found a couple of months ago um, called Just the Punctuation, which is kind of a cool website. You can put any paper into it. It can just show you, it can strip out all the letters and shows you your punctuation. So you use too many commas, too many um, parentheses, too many quotation marks, too many semicolons. It'd be kind of interesting to look at. Um, just the punctuation. It's kind of fun. Kind of, it was motivating to me. I, maybe I, because I'm a former accountant, I like these silly things like this. Um, I often have students um, post quotes of the articles in the discussions. When we bring a guest in, I have them post quotes in the chat window of the person's article, and I have them comment on it. Quotes are a wonderful way to springboard discussion. Have everyone come to class, a virtual class, a synchronous class, a face-to-face -face class, with one or two or three quotes from what they read. Those are ways in which to spur discussion. Those are ways in which to see what students find are important. Those are ways in which the students lecture to each other instead of you lecturing to them. Have them post, if it's a face-to-face, -face, have them post the quotes on the wall and discuss why those quotes are important. Have them, you know, write to the authors and get feedback on the quotes. Uh, have them go to wiki quotes, 
There's a couple other websites, Brainy Quotes. I like Brainy Quotes. Um, I'm sure you could find some to do quotes and Brainy Quotes. Uh, sorry to pick on yourself. Uh, another thing I like to do is give students 99 seconds to talk or, a, or two minutes or five minutes. Have a timer which sets the amount uh, uh, that I'm gonna allocate to them. And that's a way to limit those people who blab on and on from over dominating. So that's motivation, some ideas for motivation. I wanna move to creativity, critical thinking and so forth. Cause I, in the next 10 minutes, I wanna go through these. Another thing I use, so for critical thinking is uh, uh, focusing, uh, or no creative thinking, right? Generating, sorry, generating. So what is innovative education? What is education 3.0? What is education 4.0? On the Jamboard, let's start with that. What are, what are the principles of it? And let's, let's then discuss this and maybe create our own class learning environment. You know, what are some technology integration ideas? What tools do you use? I asked you this question to start. Mayno was reading your answers. I don't think you had any, any of these on here. You had some great ideas, but here's some more. You know, Thing Link I'm gonna talk about. Um, Miro, I'm going to talk about. Bacaro, I'm, I'm, not, I'm doing research on Duolingo. There's all sorts of things that you can use in your classes to, to integrate. I ask about education 3.0. What are the principles thereof? What does it involve? Well, mindfulness, inclusiveness, respect, equity, uh, constructivism, um, and so forth. Um, I, I often will post after my uh, lecture, I'll, I'll ask students, what, what did I just, you know, uh, what, what does each principle stand for? What, so in the read, reflect, display, and do model, what, does, what are the principles? What, what are the components? What are the features? What are, you know, what are things I have to be aware of in my environment that squelch my creativity, that limit my creativity, that hinder my creativity? What idea squelching comments or statements are gonna come at me? Instead of asking what are ways to increase creativity, ask, do reverse brainstorming. How can we decrease creativity? Instead of asking how can we, how can we um, be more cost effective, ask how we be less effective. You often you'll find that opposite question will get you insights into the original question, reverse brainstorm. Miro, I mentioned Miro um, briefly. Miro is a tool increasingly you're seeing in America on television. Apparently it's very popular in the corporate space. They're now moving into the higher ed and K-12 space because you can build all sorts of visualizations in Miro um, to showcase uh, one's thinking, whether it's analogical reasoning or whether it's um, creating timelines or taxonomies or mind maps or concept maps or comparison and contrasts or Venn diagrams, all these kinds of things are possible in Miro. If you want to download my slides, go to trainingshare.com, um, uh, trainingshare.com under archive talks, and then you can have all these links. So you don't have to write any of this down. And they have a tutorial. If you go to this slide, you can watch the tutorial on Miro and figure out how to do this in your classes. How to go to mind mapping tools like MindMeister or MindDoma, where you can embed videos and have hyperlinks and have uh, uh, the main ideas or concepts, the, the macro context, and then have the micro, the, sub, the subset of ideas underneath it. One of my students likes to build a mind map for all the discussions my classes have. He's now my TA. His name is Christian. Christian likes mind maps because it makes sense. He makes sense of the online discussions for everybody. The last thing he posts <coughs> during the week usually is the mind map from the class. My students sometimes enter their, their ideas in Wordle or Word it out or other ways to represent words visually so you can see what words are used a lot. These are from actual discussion forms of my class. So you can see what my students are talking about using the Wordle or Word Sift or Word it out. My students also use Animaker to create animation sequences or dialogues between participants. Um, ThingLink. ThingLink is a tool where you can embed graphics, you can embed videos, you can embed um, discussions or uh, text explanations. So here we've got a, this is a video that plays and there are different embedded links that if you call them up, it will play um, a conversation or a description or the scientists discussing things or a description of, of, of what you're seeing. So that th enhances your learning in effect. One of my students, Merve, has created a thing link with her CV. So in her CV, she has explanations of her CV. So if people are looking at it, she can, they, she can explain what she did there. 
I think that's really interesting to create an animated or interactive curriculum vita, uh, thingling. You can also use maps or go to museums and so forth and embed in different links to, you know, when you go to the Van Gogh Museum or some other place and explain what you're seeing at different points along the way. I'll skip over some of these. So another poll here, um, one of our last polls, poll number six, Sarah. Uh, so do you have any ideas going off in your head so far? Several ideas, maybe, not yet, nope. <laughs> no hope for, for Bog, no, there's ho no hope with this idiot presenting. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. let's see, we've got 40 people. We've got uh, 51, 52, 56, 57, 58. Um, so most people's brains are working today. Uh, why don't we end right there and we can say that and show the results. And you know, the majority of you are getting some ideas from here, 60, 70%. Um, actually we add the final, the maybe, with the maybes, 80%. So we can stop sharing at this point and we'll move on and say that most people are starting to think about what they can use, but really most people will, will like the last two categories, critical thinking and, and collaboration, because there are tools out there like Lucid for education, which enables one to do Venn diagrams, for instance, and comparison and contrast and, and some other kinds of uh, tables and and flowcharts and other hierarchies and other things. So again, with Jamboard, you can do pro and cons. What are the pros of this? What are the cons of this? Simple critical thinking activity. What are, what are your, I'll create a value line of how one feels on a topic, critically reflect on the value line from one to 10, like ratings that we're having in here with the polling questions. So having people rate things, evaluate things, having to do a Venn diagram on something. Um, a comparison and contrast chart, a KWL. What do you know about the topic? What do you want to know? What did you learn? KWL, you segment, segment information, pro and con, PMI. What are the pluses? What are the minuses? What are the interesting things? Um, you know, what, what do you want to know? What did you learn last week? What did you already know already about the topic? What do you still want to know about this topic? So what did you learn? What do you want to know? You get a prior knowledge, you get the effectiveness of the training. Then what do you want to know? What do you still want to know? PMI, what are the pluses? What are the minuses? What are the interesting things? What are the questions? You're dividing up, segmenting the learning in the class. Summarizing in a nutshell, key points, an abstract, key takeaways, recaps um, that, that, that basically are getting students to summarize and and, and bring their the gobs of knowledge coming at them into a, a, a kernel that's relevant to them, that makes sense to them and so forth. Having students reflect on big questions. There's a website called Big Questions Online or BQO, Big Issue Reflections. In my courses, I often have a week where we have just big questions that are thrown out and we have to discuss them. Remember the read, reflect, display, and do's. Reflect, 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 debrief, debrief, debrief. So you can't just generate, you have to have times for evaluation and reflection and interaction and so forth. Case analysis, scenarios, simulations that students are analyzing, you can put online rather easily. Our anatomy courses at IU are a set of cases on the web that students interact with and get different data and make solutions and solve. I mentioned I have a podcast show called Silver Lining for Learning. We've had our hundredth episode a week ago. Well, I have in my class, my students can watch these and write reflection papers on them. They can go to the, 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 the session we had with Brian Beatty or David Wiley or whomever you know, we've brought in, um, the Commonwealth of Learning with Sanjaya Mishra. And then they can reflect on what they had to say about universal design for learning or about big data or special education or whatever the topic happens to be. And this was our 100th episode that we just had in. We brought back in our guests, our, um, um, our participants who are in the, we stream it to, to YouTube in a YouTube channel every week. Um, this just Monday, this week, two nights ago, no, I'm sorry, a week ago Monday, I, I had a week where I had on social media and one of my former students, Vanessa Denon at Florida State's an expert. So I said, Vanessa, could you come into my class, chat with your current, about your research on, on, on social media and what you're currently thinking about doing. And she said, oh, sure, I'll just pop in and talk about that. It was great. The next night I had my friend, 
Saul Carliner come in from Concordia University in, in Canada, in Montreal, and he came in to talk about human performance technology. And Salk, you know, I don't know anything about human performance technology. The syllabus says I'm supposed to know something. Can you pop in and give us the history of it? And sure, he just popped in and did that, and I'll reciprocate, and you, life moves on. Well, this week, two nights ago, my former student, Ying Tang, who's actually from Hong Kong, University of Hong Kong, and I became one of her committee members. Um, she met her husband in my class and now has a baby and had a, um, so she, she's back in China. I said, Ying, could you present to my students? And she would be in a meeting all day. So we recorded it. We recorded her presentation. It's a links in there, her discussion of mobile learning and, and instant messaging and using WeChat and other things. Very, very fascinating um, discussion that I had with her just this week. Um, yeah. And so I'm having all these people come in. And so I've created a playlist of all these folks that have come into my classes and we discuss. And I noticed I got three minutes left, so I better start wrapping up towards the end. As Sarah Foley knows, I, I can sometimes go a little over. But this has been so great bringing in guests every week that I've created a playlist of the best of the best. And those that's available online uh, for my current students to watch from last semester or from the semester before. So we're archiving all this historical knowledge. So it's accumulating over time. So it's, it's aggregating all these great videos. And I've done videos on blended learning. During the pandemic, people want to know about blended. So I created a playlist of all the things I talked about on blended. The last one I won't get to today is on collaboration. And, and there are a number of ideas that you'll see in here on breakout rooms and Jamboard for collaboration. And um, Trello is a tool for project management. I want to skip over some of these here. Let me skip Nuclino. It's a free tool for um, debates. Um, I want you should check it out. But I want to end with part three. So Maine and I have a new book on um, transformative teaching around the world. And we have 42 different chapters related. Or, or, yeah, we have 42 odd chapters talking about what's going on around the world and, and, and stories. Uh, in 22 countries of teachers who are struggling as well as succeeding in terms of teaching and learning face-to-face, -face, online, and blended. Most of these are Fulbright instructors. Their, their bios and their pictures are at the beginning of every chapter. So as you flip through a chapter, you'll see my former student, Penny Ma, and other in here from Singapore or from New Zealand, whatever. And they just tell short, brief stories of uh, their uh, educational practices. And this book could be used for multicultural ed. It could be used for teaching people how to, how to teach and how to become professional educators. My former dean wrote the foreword, Gerardo Gonzalez, and Maina and I wrote the, the preface in the intro called, uh, you know, um, we were, we're trying to get making impact as the theme of this book. Um, so yeah. Um, Clicked on the wrong button here. So, so there are different sections in this book um, that that relate to um, creating a a learning environment, if you will, um, that that relate to um, uh, a teaching philosophy. And some of these are the Fulbright teachers in the program that we had in here, and so forth from Mexico, from Botswana, from India, from again from India. We had different sections of the book looking at innovative education from Thailand, from India again, from New Zealand, and, you know, um, urban farms and uh, new teacher training in Singapore. Um, we also had sections of the book about teaching with technology, again, in Singapore, Morocco, China, Cyprus. Uh, we have a section about pandemic uh, activities. Uh, we have a section of the book uh, related to English education from China, from Korea, from Thailand, um, flipping the classroom in Korea. Uh, we have a section on active learning strategies that you could use, and again, from different countries, India, New Zealand, Finland. Um, and we have a section on global collaboration, again, from Mexico, Finland, Taiwan, and then overcoming challenges in one's classes from Bhutan, from Indianapolis, from Costa Rica, from Rwanda, from Yemen. And then we wrap up the book talking about how to make impact. 
And then again, our Dean, Stacy Maroney wrote the afterword of the final part. So it, that's right, 11 o'clock. <laughs> I went rather quickly through the book, but it's just kind of a, te a teaser. Um, uh, poll question number eight uh, is, uh, are, you know, are we in an evolution or a revolution? So if you want to pull up question number eight in here. I don't know if we've got it here, um, Sarah, but poll number eight, is this an evolution or, or revolution? A is definitely yes. I don't see the poll, Sarah, I'm, for whatever reason. Um, there we go. We open the poll, definitely yes. Maybe it is. No way. Hard for me right now to think. Oh, we don't have the... The maybe it is, that's fine. We don't actually, that's a forced answer. That's good actually not having. And so we've got 86 people still with us. Thanks for hanging around to the end. Um, we'll go to Q and A in a second here. We wanna reveal the results, Sarah. Most of you say now are convinced that it's, an, it's a revolution. Uh, well, is this an evolution or revolution? Yes, it's one or the other, okay. All right, we'll stop sharing here and move on to the end. So these are some of the Fulbrighters again in the program that we had. This is a, uh, after the program ended at our local establishment called Nix. And this is the School of Education at Indiana University and the School of Colors at, at Mena's commencement, actually. So our slides are at, make sure, make sure everyone waves goodbye to Mena. No, I'm not just kidding. So our slides are at trainingshare.com. The book is at, at, the free book is at Tech Variety. Um, and our email addresses are there as well. So we should probably um, stop here for a second and see if anyone has maybe three words that you got from this session. What are three words that you got from this session? Um, like Mena is great, Mena is humble, Kurt is dumb. Three words that you got from this session. Um, thank you, Hessa. Mena, do you have any comments? I, you know, have well, summarize for us, Mena. Yeah, I don't have any comments. I think you have covered most of them. Uh, we didn't have enough time to talk about a book and then you can check out the link that I shared with you in the chat window about the book. Why don't you share the link again if people missed it, Mena, and then we'll have it twice sure. in there. So uh, inspirational, motivation and fun, whirlwind of learning. Okay. Thank you, Natalie. And Bagayam, she's with us here from Kazakhstan. Thank you for coming, my friend. See many, Natalia, thank you for coming, Natalia, and Sunny and others. So great turnout and send us more notes after this ends on email. Mena and I will respond to email. Sarah will forward emails that you send to her. Um, so, so please do that. Dazi, thanks for coming from Ottawa. So we can see our people are coming from Ottawa and from Kazakhstan and other parts of the world. This is great, from San Francisco. So now we should open for questions. Do we have any questions? Thanks from Ithaca, SUNY Cortland. Thank you, Shufan, coming from Italy, <laughs> Ithaca. An Ying, Bell's mother is here, okay. Good to have you here. And so far we don't have question. Patagonia. So someone in Patagonia is gonna get a grant funded to bring us all down. Okay, that sounds really good. I think we had a question before during your talk. Um, the first is from Giselle. I'm not sure she is still here. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself to ask question to Doug Funk? Okay, Giselle? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I pronounced uh, the name okay. correctly. Yep, go ahead and unmute. Anyone has a question? If I'm not sure if you can unmute, but try it. No, unfortunately, our participants don't have access to their mics. Um, if okay. you have questions, either put yep. them in the chat or yep. Q&A. Yeah, so Giselle, you want to put that back in, the question back in for us. Uh, what would be good ways to make asynchronous course interactive? Mainly you want to take a stab at it first and I'll go next. Or can you repeat again? Because I'm trying to search the question. Yeah. On so how can we make an asynchronous course an interactive one? 
Oh, that's a really great question. Usually in asynchronous courses, you didn't have the opportunity to directly interact with students. There are several strategies like uh, Dr. Bank mentioned, you can use Jamboard or uh, Padlet to let students discuss through asynchronous online. And also for me, I also use asynchronous discussion forum to uh, pro to pro uh, post discussion questions regarding each weekly uh, uh, readings. Uh, another strategy is to use online debate, as we mentioned, uh, Dr. Bank mentioned in the slides. Uh, Dr. Bank and I, we had a collaboration. We used uh, Nulinko together. Students from uh, both of our class, and then we can, we assign students in different rules, uh, letting them uh, read the books um, and then debate online. So these are the different approaches that I experienced to engage <laughs> Learners, uh, Dr. Bank may share more. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's asking for rubber chickens. They've seen me present. I don't have any rubber chickens, Bob, um, but we can try and come up. Maybe I have one in the basement. But how do we get people to, to interact? One is have critical friends. You have discussions. You have email pals. You have ways of interaction. You have built in inter interaction structures. If it's asynchronous, you have reflections on it. You reflect on the asynchronous and you share those reflections, maybe in a database that others can see the reflections and comment on those reflections. You build interactive interactions, iterations um, uh, within. So you take the online discussions, you have people print out their favorites and then write reflection papers on their favorites and post what are, you know, maybe, maybe a concept map on those asynchronous discussions. Create maybe even a, a timeline of the things talked about in the asynchronous discussions. You create a, um, maybe a, a, a ranking of the ideas that they find in the, in the asynchronous discussion. And anybody whose ideas are ranked the highest, you give the highest two or three people bonus points to get them more maybe competitive to see who can post the most voted on item if you want competition. Now, I'm not saying competition is what I try and do, but that's one way to build in the interactivity around the asynchronous um, activities, having people vote on the best week's discussion or person of the week or um, you know some kind of um, acknowledgement uh, of the of who's posting. You have people create a concept map on the asynchronous discussion, so they see a summary or recap of who's presented. So they're seeing their ideas get validated. You don't want to just have things be a one-off in the bin. You want to do something with those ideas in the asynchronous. What was generated? what was reflected upon, what was created. You don't just create and do nothing with it. You find ways to wrap around the content of a course. So you, you create from the discussion form, maybe you write chapters in a book, you write a book or a book chapter. You write, you do activities that wrap around what, what you're attempting to do. Um, other questions that we have here. Uh, yes, um, so, I will repeat Jesus' question. I'm not sure whether I pronounced your name correctly. If not, please forgive me. So uh, the question is, what can be done with the learners who still expect a traditional model of learning? Yeah. And Martha Nikos from the School of Ed is asking if any of the authors of the book would like to make a comment. So un unfortunately, we don't have the capability of giving them audio control. But anyone who is an author of the book, if you could type in um, something and say hello to Martha, who's, who's interested in your perspective. Um, she'd like to hear from you in Kazakhstan or in China or wherever, Botswana or wherever. We, the, one, there are several authors of the book here. Um, this format doesn't allow you to then. Um, Mena, you wanna repeat um, uh, that comment you just made? Uh, the question is, what can be done with the learners who still expect a traditional mode of learning? Yeah, you, you're going to have people who are expecting. So you want to, you don't want to jump too heavily into the ocean. You want to stay near the safe harbors of the shoreline. So you experiment with low risk, low cost, low time activities and get people small successes in doing them. As they're gaining those small successes, as they get those small kinds of successes along the way, then you have opportunities to build upon that. If you're doing these one-off kinds of activities, you can build new activities from that. Um, and, and so, for instance, video everyone's attuned to. So incorporating in shared online video that you find on Elbert Bandura 
like I did last night, I had five such videos on Ben Durek, him himself explaining the theory, seeing it in action in the communities, um, and, and seeing in commercials that you'd watch. And then you work towards having students design. So you, first you're watching, reflecting. When I did Wikibooks, we had students critique a Wikibook. We had them um, uh, debate it. We had them write reflection papers on it. We had them edit one. Then I had them build it. So you have to start small. If people are used to lectures and used to um, pre-recorded videos and flip classrooms, you start with that. And then you work towards them designing their own videos. You work towards them creating their own channel. You work towards them writing their own book. You don't start with that right away. You start with some simple activities based on what they're already doing and you gradually nudge them into the deeper waters. That would be my answer to that. And that does work typically. Um, other questions? We're at... We have, a question. Yeah, go ahead. we have a question from Linda. Uh, I'm not sure her question is, what was the title that you mentioned about authentic assessment? Uh, I'm not sure which page when you mentioned that. Do you, can you recall that, Dr. Long? So the book title is all called Authentic Online Learning. And, and Mena could maybe look up um, uh, the link for the book from Tom, just Tom Reeves, Authentic online learning. There's it actually that book is available for free. Um, that I found a download link, and uh, apparently the author, the editor, has made that book full book available. It's ten years old or so, but it's a good book, and it's, you learn a lot from it. And yeah, I you know if if you can't find it, man, I'll do some digging right now here. That's a great oh, yeah, question. I found, I found that a guide to authentic. Uh, right, e that's it. That's it. Okay, so the link. you will get a free book. You didn't even, we didn't even promise on the front end here. So, <laughs> you know, go ahead. Go, yeah. So we've got other questions here. Yeah, um, another question from the, that's, that's uh, about a uh, question. You mentioned the great strategy students lecturing to each other. Can you, uh, can you elaborate a little more on this? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, one is I, ha I have 20 students in my class, let's say, or 25. And I tell everybody to come to class with a, a one or two or three quotes from the five articles they read this week, or they're reading four articles in the class this week. For every article that they read, they have to bring one quote in. And they might take those quotes and in small teams, hand them to another team, and they have to explain that quote and what the article is about. That'd be one way to get them to interact around discussion. You could also have poster sessions around those quotes or panel of discussions around those quotes. What I do is have students line up and they, they get center stage and they have 99 seconds to explain all the quotes that they found. Their team, let's say they, they work in a small team for six minutes or 12 minutes and they discuss those quotes from the articles. I then have them line up and, and present to the class what they got from the articles based on the quotes. That's group one, five people, they sit down. Then group two comes up and presents their quotes and sits down in group three. And then I might have them interact across the groups and come to some conclusions about what the content, what the key content for the week was and what we're discussing for that week. And so that's a way to discuss the articles with the students discussing it. The students are lecturing. I haven't said a thing. I haven't presented anything. They've presented it all, or I have them come to class virtual this week, come with a virtual poster summarizing the article. I have a come, come to a face-to-face -face class with a poster on the wall of the articles for the week. And they we have a mini conference, a mini panel, a mini symposium on the articles that everybody's in charge of one research study, let's say. So that's a way to get them to lecture on what they've read, discuss what they've read uh, during the week that way. Mena, you have any more? No, I think you have already covered uh, good points. Yeah. We have one uh, final question, I think uh, based on my uh, rec recording here. So the, is, this is from Bagim. Uh, the question is, what are the main criteria to have a successful collaborative solving, collaborative solving environment? For example, ill-defined tasks or well-defined ones? 
I mean, what are put, maybe put the primary on. question are what, what are the main criteria to have successful collaborative learning environment? No, so I'm, I'm not sure what, yeah. What are successful features of a, of a highly intense and interactive collaborative environment? Yeah. One, you have to respect the, the learners and where they're coming from, their cultural histories and backgrounds, their, their prior experiences, their expectations. So one thing you can do is ask them what their commitments in the class is, ask them their expectations, ask them about their prior experiences. You wanna accumulate some of that knowledge, but you don't wanna to know too much that will bias you to, to maybe expect too little of people. You want to always be striving to learn more and do more. Um, so yeah, you want to find out a bit about preferences and history and so forth um, and what their interest areas are, what they're curious about doing, what they've already accomplished, what they're trying to do, what, what, what maybe they hope to do next. So all that um, is important. You want to repeat that question, by the way? Um. The question is, what are the main criteria to have a successful collaborative solving? I'm not sure what it is, solving environment, collaborative, maybe problem solving environment. Or yeah, openness, flexibility, respect, genuineness, open, openness to ideas, respect for others' ideas, genuineness in presenting your ideas, um, and flexibility in, in the, the submission of ideas. Uh, and uh, the sharing of one's background with each other so they understand, they have some mutual understanding, there's some empathy uh, to share their, their stories, their life histories a bit, a portion, um, but so they can build intersubjectivity among your participants. The more they know about each other and can understand about group members and how they function and what their expectations are, what their goals are, um, that can help. No, it doesn't always help. That can provide um, a positive influence, but there has to be modeling. Uh, there has to be uh, the instructor involvement in those uh, in those teams. You can't just say go work together and walk away. You have to structure those teams for that roles that you uh, re roles responsibilities and other kinds of things. Any other questions today? I think that's all the question from as far as I know from the chat window. If Sarah has uh, see any other questions. Please feel free to share with Dr. Bang. No, I don't see anything from this end. So this might be a good time to uh, wrap up. Uh, I just want to say a big thank you to Curtis and Mena for an engaging session and for sharing your insights and expertise on how to engage online learners. A lot of great takeaways today and a lot of great tidbits that um, our participants can use in their practice. And a big thank you to everyone for joining us. I can see by the comments that you found this session as fascinating as I did. So as I mentioned at the uh, beginning, I'll post the recording to the sessions once it has processed on teachonline.ca under the webinar series tab. Um, and also that will be emailed out to you um, through the Zoom system in about 24 hours. Um, you can also find underneath our webinar series, our list of upcoming webinars coming up on April 26. So in two weeks, we have how to improve assessment and feedback practice uh, hosted by Sarah Knight from just in the UK. Um, so hope to see you there. So thank you again, Curtis and Mina, and thank you everybody for joining us. And I wish you all a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.